<sighs> Another rainy morning spent with you, my favorite folks. Welcome to Cozy Horror with me, Dr. Plague. Well, let's get right into it and see what we can find. Death is never easy. It's always something that hangs over us like a pall. But when the subject of that death keeps rearing its ugly head again and again, especially when the death was especially tragic, it's hard to ignore what lies beyond the veil. Emily sighed as she stood in the doorway of her childhood home. She hadn't wanted to move home like this, but it seemed silly to leave the house empty after her father's death. When she opened the door, the familiar smells of childhood had assaulted her, bringing tears to her eyes as she remembered all the good times she'd had here. Christmas mornings, birthdays, nights spent on the couch as she and her dad watched whatever was on TV. The old place meant a lot to her, and she had hoped that something like this wouldn't happen for a good long time. Dad's dementia had taken him quickly, and the old house was all she had left now. Emily had lost her mother when she was young. In a way, that was a blessing. Emily had been too young to mourn her, or even to miss her, and her dad had filled the gap easily. He had never shied away from the tasks that he didn't know how to do, and to Emily, he had always been the best dad ever. When she'd gone to college the year before, she had worried about leaving him by himself, but he assured her that he could manage. When he'd gotten the diagnosis from his doctor the year before, he hadn't wanted to tell her at first. It was nothing for sure, he'd told her, and he'd have plenty of time left. Emily didn't need to worry about him, not when she had school to worry about. He downplayed it for three months, but Emily began to notice little changes in him that worried her. He couldn't remember what year it was sometimes. He forgot that he was retired now. He called her late sometimes, wanting to know why she wasn't home from school. It didn't come to a head, though, until the police called her after he'd tried to go to work one morning at an office his company no longer owned. Emily had taken a break from school, but his decline had become a freefall. Gone was the loving man who had always been her strength and guidance. Her dad forgot who she was, calling her by her aunt's name more than hers, and fighting her over simple things as she tried to boss him around because she was older. Emily had been out grocery shopping when he had passed. In the end, dementia hadn't gotten him. He had hung himself in the living room for whatever reason, and the neighbors had called an ambulance when they saw him in the big bay window that looked out over the front lawn. Emily remembered that day as she took boxes out of her SUV. In retrospect, she should have known something was amiss. It was the first week of October, Dad's favorite month, and he had been doing a little better. He brightened up as they set up the Halloween decorations. Emily remembered him calling her kiddo again, and ruffling her hair like he'd done when she was little. He'd been doing better. He'd seemed more lucid and more in the world. And on the day she'd gone out for groceries, he told her there was a program he wanted to watch and that he'd be okay. She thought about insisting, but decided it would probably be fine. She told him that she'd be right back, and when he told her that he loved her, she smiled for the first time in a while. When she'd gotten the call... She'd been unable to answer as she slid to the fetal position in the soup aisle of Publix. No one could have said why he had done it, but he was gone, all the same. Now she was left with nothing but a big empty house full of memories and questions. Need a hand, Em? Emily turned, knowing that voice. It was Glenn from across the street, and she shifted the box in her arms as she pointed back towards the SUV. Glenn was no spring chicken, but he gladly grabbed a couple of boxes and walked them into the house. 
It's weird being in here without Frank, he commented, catching himself a moment later and apologizing. I'm sorry, kiddo. I, I know that no one knows that better than you do. It's okay, Emily said. He's, he's at peace now. I know he hadn't been at peace for a while. Glenn set the box down in the living room, and as they went to get more, he commented that it was weird to see the yard so empty. I don't think I've ever seen it lacking its usual ghosts and ghouls this close to Halloween. Emily nodded. I know, but it, it seemed inappropriate to keep them up. She had taken them down the day of Dad's wake. Emily had returned from the wake, looked at all the tombstones and ghosts, and just couldn't take it anymore. She had taken it all down as the floodlights presided over the yard and just tossed it into the garage. If some of them broke, then that was just too bad. Emily had been happier for their passing once they had been put away, and she had gone to the funeral in a much better mood. Think you might put them up again before Halloween? Glenn asked. Maybe, Emily said, but in her mind, she doubted it. It was nine days till Halloween, and the last thing on Emily's mind was decorating the yard for a bunch of kids. Emily thanked Glenn for his help, and as the door closed behind her, all she really wanted to do was sleep. Just the act of moving her things in with the intention of staying was more than she could bear. She decided that tomorrow she would start moving her dad's things into the garage and putting her own stuff in the house. It would be hard, but she knew that it would go miles to making her feel better about staying here full time. As she had moved boxes into the living room earlier, she had smelled the old spice that her dad had always worn and kept catching hints of old cigar smoke from his recliner. They were comfortable smells, smells from her childhood, but now they only filled her with unsurmountable sadness. As she snugged down in the guest bedroom, the place she'd been sleeping since she'd come back to live here, she hoped it would be easier as she cleaned out the old house. She hoped that maybe there would be some answers somewhere amongst Dad's old things as well. Emily was packing things into a box when she heard the knock on the front door the next day. It had been a rough morning, but Emily felt like she was making progress. The living room had been packed into two kinds of boxes, keep and donate. Most of Dad's stuff was going to be donated, his knickknacks not really fitting in with her stuff, the billy bass, the fishing trophies, and the last of Mom's precious memories figurines had gone into the donation box. But the pictures and some of the other things were staying. They looked a little odd next to Emily's things, her Funkos clashing with Dad's ceramic ducks. But some of these things were such a huge part of her childhood that she couldn't bear to get rid of them. The mallard with the green stripe was the one that she had painted herself, the one they had painted together, and the transition between Emily's childhood paintings and Dad's smooth brush strokes were evident. She had cried over that duck, the plaster threatening to shatter as she clutched it to her chest. The duck's fragility had been saved by the knock on the front door. It was Glenn again, and Emily remembered that he'd agreed to take some of the boxes to the Salvation Army for her. When she opened the door, however, she was surprised to see that the Halloween decorations were again set up in the yard. I'm glad to see you feeling better. I was surprised to see the yard set up again. Did you have a wild hair last night? Emily looked out at the yard, but as she shook her head, Glenn must have realized that this wasn't her doing. Weird thing for kids to do. Can't imagine anyone on the block would just break into your garage and set up your Halloween decorations. He took the boxes and said he'd bring her a receipt, and Emily thanked him as she closed the door. With the door between her and the real world, Emily felt herself give in to the creeping sense of trespass. The whole thing freaked Emily out. She assured herself that she was making too much out of it, but she knew that she wouldn't be comfortable until the decorations were put away again. She set aside her unpacking as she cleaned up the ghosts and the gravestones, putting them in the boxes as she slid them into the crawl space over the garage. 
she must have been more tired than she thought last night to miss someone moving around outside all night. As she closed the little door in the ceiling of the garage, she wondered if maybe she should call the police. They had technically broken into her garage, though Emily doubted if it had been locked in the first place. She decided to let it slide this time and go back to setting up the living room. It was getting late, and she knew that soon her thoughts would be on dinner. When someone knocked the next day, Emily looked up from her lunch and found Glenn on the front porch again. She'd been too busy to check the lawn this morning, going straight to work on the kitchen as she moved in her appliances. And as she saw the tombstones and the ghosts had returned to their usual spot, she felt the dread rising in her throat. She was absolutely going to call the police this time. She had locked the garage, locked the crawl space with the padlock her dad had always used. If the kids dragged them out this time, it would qualify as breaking and entering. Glenn smiled as she opened the door, but he looked uncomfortable this time as he stood wringing his hat in his hands. He looked like someone delivering bad news, and Emily wasn't sure how much more bad news she could handle. Hey there, Em. Just coming to make sure everything's okay. Emily thought about brushing him off, but decided to be truthful with him. You know, Glenn, not really. Someone keeps breaking into my garage and setting up my Halloween decorations. I can keep a sense of humor about it, but it's getting harder and harder as time goes on. Glenn nodded. I can imagine. I'll see if somebody has picked up anything on their cameras so we can see what's going on. Some of your neighbors, though, had mentioned something in the house. I know that people mourn in their own way, but just thought I'd make sure you were feeling okay. Emily gave him a questioning look as she grew tired of his beating around the bush. Glenn, why don't you come out and say what's bothering you? The old man looked a little offended, but he tried to brush off her briskness. Someone said you had a silhouette in the front window of someone hanging. I like to think I know you better than that, but I know that grieving does weird things to people, and I just thought I'd come make sure you were okay. Emily gaped at him. I can assure you, Glenn, I haven't had anything like that in my window. It's sick, and I would have thought you knew me better than that. Glenn and her father had been old friends since Dad had moved into the house, and Emily had grown up with Glenn's daughter and son. The families had been close, and Glenn had even come over to help her with her father a lot when he went downhill. For Glenn to ask her if she had done something like that was extremely hurtful and he seemed a little more at ease by her answer. I, I told them they were wrong, but you wouldn't do something like that. I'll let you be, Em. I was just making sure everything was okay. Emily waited till he had gone back to his own house and went to take the decorations down again. She packed them into their boxes, bringing them inside as she put them in the coat closet. Let the kids look through the garage for them now. They wouldn't find anything and maybe this would dissuade them from this little game. She wasn't sure why they had chosen her house for this anyway. Dad had been well-loved by the kids in the neighborhood, and his house had been a mandatory stop for any kid looking for good candy. She thought again about calling the cops, but decided that hiding the decorations might be enough this time. She went back to sorting through the things, but she couldn't recapture the mood she'd left. She just kept going back to busybody Glenn and the dumb kids who couldn't leave well enough alone, and she just got madder and madder the longer it went on. She finally tossed an old blender into the box, shattering the attached pitcher and growling as she went to get her keys. She was going out. She wanted to be anywhere but here. She climbed into her SUV, and as she looked back, she did a double take, unable to believe what she'd seen. It was only for a second, but she'd seen something swinging from behind the curtains in that second. It had been a man-shaped thing, hanging by the neck, but as she scanned every inch of the thick curtains, she couldn't find anything that looked anything like a swinging body. Maybe what Glenn had told her had gotten into her head, Emily thought, trying to put it out of her mind as she pulled out of the driveway. She came back after dark, having spent time with some college friends as she vented about the situation. They all agreed that it sounded terrible and thought Emily should have called the cops after the first time. 
Emily hadn't hung out with her friends like this for a while. Usually she was on a time limit and spent the whole time looking at her watch. It was nice not to constantly worry about her dad, but that made her feel guilty all over again. As her lights fell across the yard, she could see the Halloween decorations once again spread across it. Emily came angrily out of her car, taking three or four steps for the door, when the light in the living room suddenly came on. Emily felt her legs wobble ominously then. Behind the thick curtains, the lights, looking soft and inviting, was the silhouette of a swinging body. She stood there for a full sixty seconds, watching it slowly swing to and fro, and when the outline of the head seemed to turn in her direction, she loosed a loud scream and backpedaled. Emily stumbled back to her car, her legs feeling only about half under her control, and she drove her car halfway down the street before she took out her phone and called the police. They told her they'd be there in a few minutes, but when they asked if she felt safe going back to her house, she told them that she didn't and wanted someone to meet her down the street. They said they would, and when a blue and white drove past her, another pulled up next to her to see if she was the caller. They questioned her about the break-in, but halfway through her statement, the officer radioed and told him to bring her home. Is the residence secure? The officer called, jotting some notes. The residence is locked and shows no sign of entry. We need her to come let us in so we can search inside. That's impossible, Emily breathed. I, I saw something hanging in the living room. The officer agreed to come back with her, and Emily tried not to hyperventilate as she drove home. Some of the neighbors had come out to see the show, and she could see Glenn peeking out of his window as she pulled back in and came shakily from her vehicle. The living room lights were off, and the house looked dark and brooding. Emily felt her eyes creeping to the window as she walked across the lawn. She opened the door with the key, letting the police go first as they searched the home. The house was just as she'd left it. The living room was devoid of anything that could cast a shadow like that. Nothing was taken. No windows or doors were forced open. The only thing that had been moved were the decorations, and the police seemed disinterested in the whole thing. They left after searching the house, saying they would ask her neighbors if they'd seen anyone lurking around the home. As they pulled away, Emily stood in the yard and watched them go. She could feel the way her neighbors looked at her as they shuffled off to bed, and it felt like bees crawling on her skin. They thought she was making things up, playing it up for attention, but how could they think such a thing? She had cared for her dad for nearly a year, even sticking it out through the rough times, but it seemed that now the real horror had started. As they all went inside, the lights came on behind her, and the shadow cast across her was dreadfully familiar. Emily walked back to the car, called her friend Nina, and asked if she could stay with her. She would come back later for her things, but for the moment, Emily just wanted to go anywhere but here. Emily put the last of her boxes in the car and took one last look at her childhood home. The Halloween decorations were still there, looking a little windblown and lame next to the new addition to the yard. The realtor had been very interested in getting her hands on the house and saw no reason why it shouldn't sell quickly. When Emily told her about her father's suicide, the realtor told her it wouldn't stop most buyers. You'd be surprised how many people want to live in a possibly haunted house. The thought of selling the house made her deeply sad, but she hadn't even been able to come back until the sign was there. Nina had offered to come back with her, but Emily had said this was something she had to do on her own. Nina had said that she could live with her until she sold the house, her having just lost her roommate. Emily was happy for the invitation and had gone to the house early in the morning to get her things. Most of it was still packed in boxes, but she wanted a few things of her dad's that she had chosen to keep. The painted ducks, the family photos, the other things from her dad's room. The rest could be sold with the house for all she cared. It would likely raise the value of the place anyway, but she would have just as easily cut the price if they didn't want it. She heard the leaves crunch from the fence line 
and looked up to see Glenn walking over. I'm just getting my things and leaving, she said, closing the door and standing her ground. Good, Glenn said, his usual fatherly tone gone. I think that would be best. Yeah, Emily thought. His messages had made that pretty clear. Glenn had been another part of the reason she hadn't been back. He had called her the day after, wanting to know why the police had been there and why she had left that awful thing in the living room. He'd been patient with her. They all had, but that thing was in poor taste and downright disrespectful to her father. When she hadn't returned his calls, he called the next day and told her that he was going to use his key and take the thing down and that her father would be ashamed of her. It seemed that the neighbors had turned on her too, and now she was a social pariah. Good for them, Emily thought. She was leaving, so they could think what they wanted of her. You planning on taking down the Halloween decorations before you go? I wouldn't want any of the local kids to accidentally wander over to your house expecting candy. She knew what he was referring to, but she didn't bite. I paid the realtor extra to stage the house. I'm not coming back. Glenn nodded, clearly unhappy, as he turned to leave. Emily let him go, looking back at the house for a final time before leaving as well. Despite the hour, she could still see the slight outline that would haunt her dreams from behind those thick curtains that had graced the window since she was young. She'd been in the living room many times, trying to find anything that could have explained the shadow cast there. But there was nothing. It was as if that moment was frozen just behind the curtain, and if Emily could get beyond it, maybe she could save her dad before he took himself out of the disease's path. The realtor pulled in as Emily was looking at the house, smiling and waving as she told Emily the good news. I've got three interested parties already. They love the neighborhood and can't wait to see the property. Looks like you might be shed of this place sooner than expected. Emily told her that sounded great. As she climbed behind the wheel, she watched as the realtor picked up the Halloween decorations and hastily tucked them under her arm. The for sale sign seemed to wave goodbye as she pulled out of the driveway for the final time. As she watched her clean up, Emily wondered how many times she would clean up those same decorations before finally leaving it up as a lost cause. She wondered how many times the neighbors would call her to complain about the decoration that she couldn't touch before she finally lost her mind. It seemed her dad's final legacy would be what swung beyond the veil, no matter what the neighbors thought. Man, it's really coming down out there. I'm glad you've got such a warm, cozy place to spend your time here with me with so many great stories. Let's face it, school is hard sometimes, especially when you're not the most studious of pupils. Sometimes, even those who keep their mind on their bookwork need a little extra credit. <sighs> I don't usually do this kind of thing, but I'd fallen behind in my studies. I've always been an honor roll student. I had some B's here and there, but mostly fantastic grades. I wasn't big into extracurricular activities, but I was a library assistant, and I did a little volunteer work for the required hours I needed to graduate. That all changed when I turned 17. My parents had gotten me a car for my birthday. Nothing fancy, but four wheels and an engine is always nice. But it came with a caveat. If I wanted to drive it, I needed to pay the insurance on it. This led me to pick up a job which led to a lot of closing shifts at my local fast food chain and not a lot of time for studying or doing homework. So when Mr. Castleberry told me I was going to fail 12th grade English if I didn't bring my grades up, I asked him if there wasn't something we could do to work this out. I had meant extra credit, maybe a makeup assignment or retake a test, but it seemed he had other ideas. He looked around as if what we were going to talk about was likely to get him in trouble, and then he scribbled something on a piece of paper and handed it to me. When I asked him what it was, he told me to open it when I got to my car, not to tell anybody. I refused to say anything else about it after that, and as I sat in the front seat of my car reading the message, I was a little weirded out. 
I mean, you saw these sorts of situations in adult films or in the back of Hustler magazines, but you really never thought it would happen in real life. Meet me at my house at 7.30 before sunset. Be prepared to stay till dawn. I started to go back in and tell him there was no way in hell, but I needed this particular class to graduate. Who knows, maybe he just liked to hang out with his students in the middle of the night. I didn't believe that for a second, but I decided that it was worth looking into. If I wasn't comfortable with it, I could always take the bad grade and figure something else out. It worked out pretty good because I was off that night, and Mr. Castleberry lived about 15 minutes from my house. I pulled up outside his house at about 7.15 and saw him peeking out the curtains as I came up to knock. He threw the door open, looking around as if to see if I'd been followed, and then practically pulled me inside by the front of my shirt as he closed and locked the door. He threw about four different locks, as well as a chain, and then told me to follow him to the bedroom. I raised an eyebrow. This was a little fast, but I did as he asked and figured we would talk over the particulars once we got there. When I stepped into the bedroom, I noticed that Mr. Castleberry had an odd setup. His bed sat in the middle of a circle that I had a sneaking suspicion might be silver. The walls were covered in holy symbols, and Mr. Castleberry was finishing a circle of salt around the bed as I took it all in. He pursed his lips, clearly not sure how to begin, and sat down on the bed as he tried to figure out how to explain. We don't have a lot of time, so I'll try to be quick. I have a demon inside me, a demon that only comes out after sunset. Ball, I laughed, thinking he was joking, but his face was stone-cold serious. Hand of God, that's what the circle and the salt is for. I have people I know who come and sit with me and make sure the demon doesn't escape somehow. But sometimes I have to ask my students to stand in. I just need you to sit here and watch me until dawn. After that, you'll have your A. I sighed, thinking this over. It appeared... He didn't want anything sexual, but he was certainly after something weird. Mr. Castleberry had always seemed like such a normal guy who would have thought he was clearly some kind of weirdo who thought he was possessed by a demon or something. Whatever, I thought. An A was an A, and I needed to pass the class. Okay, so what do I do if this thing gets out? Mr. Castleberry was getting comfy in bed. There's a box beside your chair. Use what's in there. The gun is a last resort. The bullets in it are very expensive, so I, I hope you're a good shot. Don't call the police and don't invite anyone over. You got that? I nodded, reaching down beside the chair and finding the box as he got comfortable. Good. Sun's going down, so it won't be long. Oh, the, the demon will try to tempt you. Just make sure you don't listen to anything he has to say. There's earplugs in the box, but I don't recommend you use anything electronic to block him out. Why not, I asked, taking a battered old Bible and cross out of the box. The gun inside was a heavy old revolver, and it looked like it would blow a hole through a barn if I used it. There were earplugs, a spray bottle labeled HW that I assumed would hurt the demon too. When Mr. Castleberry didn't answer, I asked him again as I looked up. He was lying on the bed, arms crossed over his chest as he mouthed the words to a prayer I didn't know. He was speaking in Latin or Spanish or something, and as the sun got lower, he seemed to be fighting to finish it. His tongue was getting heavy, his words growly, and he was twitching like an epileptic. As the sun slid down the horizon and true dark overtook the town, his eyes popped open, and I heard a sound like someone popping all their vertebrae at once. He roared like a charging rhino, and his body contorted on the bed like someone being flayed alive. I jumped as he writhed on the bed, knocking over the chair as I went for the door. I needed to call the hospital. This, this was beyond a joke. He needed help. No! Mr. Castleberry forced out. D -d Don't leave! Stay till... Dawn! Only... Wait! But that appeared to be all I would get from Mr. Castleberry. He went limp then, 
falling back on the bed as a soft and satisfying growl left him. As he lay there, I watched as his chest rose and fell. What was going on with him? Was he actually possessed? I shook that thought off. I had been raised Catholic, but the older I got, the less sure I was that God even existed. If there was no God, then there was no devil, so there were no demons either. That meant that the school board was just letting someone like Mr. Castleberry teach kids with whatever mental illness he had going on, probably schizophrenia or multiple personalities or something. I didn't know, but if I had to stay here all night to get an A, then... I supposed I would. I was going to be tired at work tomorrow, but I had Sunday off, so I could always recuperate then. Ah, yes. The Sabbath is a good day to rest. It was good enough for the Almighty, at least. So I suppose it's good enough for you, too. I felt my breath stick in my throat. The voice I had heard from the bed had been as different from Mr. Castleberry as sandpaper was to velvet. Whoever was talking sounded like the kind of people who do the kind of ASMRs that get you banned on YouTube. It was the kind of voice that lures kids into wells, the kind of voice that lures women away from happy marriages, the kind of voice that leaves men questioning their sexuality. I looked up to find Mr. Castleberry reclined on the bed, his head resting on his hand in what was likely supposed to be a seductive pose. His eyes were smoldering, something I hadn't thought them capable of, and his smile was predatory. He was sizing me up like a predator preparing to spring, and I felt my skin erupt in goosebumps. Mr. Castleberry? It laughed, and I felt like I should join it, but force myself not to. The old man has gone to bed, but you can talk to me if you want. My name is Satan. I scoffed. No way in hell. I'm sure Satan has better things to do than bother my English teacher. <laughs> Very astute. The Spanish girl he brought in last time screamed and ran out of the room when I told her that. I see you have a thicker skin, though. You may call me Raish, and what may I call you? I started to tell him, but I seemed to remember something about telling a demon your name and decided not to give him my real name. Sam, I said, earning a wide, toothy grin from the imp. Astute and cagey. I like that. So how about you break that salt circle and let me out? I'm sure we could have some fun before this old fuddy-duddy gets up. Wouldn't the, wouldn't the silver hold you inside, too? I asked dubiously. Raish peeked over the bed and chuckled. That crafty old duck. Who knew he could afford that much silver on a teacher's budget? Well, no matter. If you step inside the circle, breaking it with your foot... Then it isn't a circle, and I can come out. Come on. What do you say? found myself considering it. I had actually prepared to stand up when I realized what I was doing. I didn't really know anything about this creature. A change my mind had made from mental disease to creature. And I was just going to trust him? No. No, I didn't think so. I planted my bottom and shook my head. I don't think so, I said, and was surprised to find that I was almost apologetic. Ray shrugged. Of course not. Why would you release me for free? Why wouldn't you want to get something out of this after all? So what is it you want? What is this old man offering you to keep watch over me? Uh, I floundered, finally deciding on the truth. Uh, an A in his English class. It sounded lame, and when Raish laughed, I knew he had thought so too. A meaningless mark of completion. I could make you rich 
beyond your wildest dreams. Get you any one person, any twelve people you desire, or set you up in such a way that not graduating from school would be the least of your worries. I could do so much for you, and I don't even need to take your soul. I just need you to free me. It's been so long since I was free to roam the night, and I'm so very hungry. He had been weaving a spell around me, drawing me into his promises, but that last brought me back to my senses. What would this thing do if it got loose? Who would it hurt if it was just allowed to roam the night? I shook my head, trying to get the invasive words out of my skull, and when I turned back, Mr. Castleberry, or Raish, or whoever he was, looked disappointed. A pity. I really could have done more for you than this old stick. I ignored him after that, though he did not return the favor. I brought some books so I could work on my homework, but he was talking too much for me to concentrate. I spent a few hours trying to complete my geometry homework while he offered to help, offered to give me the answers, offered to do things I'd rather not think about, and a hundred other such offers. He also threatened me, offered a thousand different punishments for not letting him out, only to walk them back a moment later and apologize. I checked my watch as I finally closed the book and discovered it was only 10.30. I'd been at this for three hours and didn't seem to be going by quickly. Only eight more hours till sunrise, he said, guessing the source of my size. Plenty of time for you to change your mind. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the earplugs, pushing them in and taking my American history homework out. Two hours of mostly silence later, I put it away and looked up to find Raish looking at me a little too intently. I yawned, getting sleepy as I pulled out my phone and scrolled through TikTok. I couldn't hear it, and as I reached for my headphones, I remembered what Mr. Castleberry had said. He had warned me about using electronic headphones, but I figured one probably would be fine. Besides, they had noise reduction on them. That had to count for something. Race tried to call out to me when I swapped the earplug for a headphone, but I ignored him as I popped it in. I was listening to a two-minute story about something or another, but as I scrolled to the next one, I was surprised to find it was a live stream from a familiar room. I could see myself sitting there, face glued to the phone, but as I watched, Raish looked straight at the camera and smiled. I was infuriated. Mr. Castleberry was just live streaming himself as he scared some dumb kid of the week. In fact, the title of the stream was High School Kid Tormented by Demon, though Demon was in air quotes. He had tricked me. Why would he do that? Why indeed? Raish asked, staring at me through the camera as if he could see me through the phone. What do you owe him? He made a fool of you online. What if your friends saw this? What would they think? You'd be a social outcast. Why not give them something to watch? I bet you'd love nothing more than to wrap your hands around this fool's throat and choke the life out of him. Do it. No one would know. Just walk over here and... I was getting up, but as I took a step towards the bed, alarm bells rang in my head. Raish was messing with me. Looking back down at my phone, I could see it was just a generic TikTok shop stream. And when I looked back up, Raish was so close that his nose was pressed against the barrier. Come on, just one more step. One more step, and you can do whatever you want to him. Kill him, kiss him, do his laundry. I don't care. Just let me out. He bellowed, and I stumbled back into my chair as he laughed. After that, I 
I just watched TikTok with the subtitles on. I didn't trust my ears anymore. I made it till two, but after that, my yawns started to sneak up on me. I wished I'd brought an energy drink or something. I wasn't used to staying up this late, not regularly, and my eyes were getting heavy. I swapped over to an adventure game on my phone, but it kept slipping longer and longer the later I got. I could see Raish watching me, cat-like, as if just waiting for me to nod off. He was tricky, and I wondered if Mr. Castleberry had any coffee in his kitchen. I just had to make it a little longer. Just a few more hours, and I was home free. I made it till 3.10 before I lost the fight. One moment I was running my 8-bit night through my 100th dungeon, and the next I heard someone giggling from the bed. I looked up to find not the leering Raish, but Stephanie Morgan from my math class. She was joined by Tina Feller, Debbie Ross, and half of the cheerleading squad, whose names I was a little foggy on. They were in their underwear and seemed to be beckoning me to come join them. There were comments about long division and making a human pyramid, and as I got slowly to my feet, something seemed off. Where was Raish? He'd been there a minute ago. He might not have been present, but something in their voices as they called me to the bed reminded me of him. It was underneath their voice. Something wicked and hidden, and I shook my head and snapped my eyes open not a moment too soon. I was standing at the edge of the circle again. I'd lost twenty minutes, and Raish was cursing like a sailor as he had a tantrum in the middle of the large bed. He was thrashing hard enough to jounce the frame, but not hard enough to disturb the salt. He looked at me with real scorn on his face, clearly contemplating all the terrible things he wanted to do to me. You were so close. The booby trap always gets them. I was wide awake now, but I knew it wouldn't last long unless I found something to focus on. Three hours. I had three hours. Despite the knowledge, I smiled at the old imp. Can't trick me, Raish. No deceitful person will dwell in my house. No liar will stand in my presence. To my surprise, Raish sat back like I'd slapped him. I blinked. That was different. What? Not a big fan of scripture? Raish looked at me sardonically. Obviously. I would prefer if you keep it to yourself in the future. Message received, I thought. Maybe there was more to God than I had thought. So that was how I spent the last three hours of my night. I kept the old worn Bible on my lap, and whenever Raish would start trying to worm his way back in, I would begin to read from it. It put him off talking, right up until the sky began to lighten. Then he turned to me, my eyes barely staying open, and delivered one final bit of crypticness. I don't have much time. When you think back on this night, I want you to remember th that you c could have had more than this old stick ever. <clears throat> he growled out. As the first rays of light came up over the windowsill, he twisted violently, so violently that I thought he had broken his neck. He twitched a few more times, screaming hoarsely until he finally settled back into bed. I sighed in relief as he twitched again, realizing it was over as I packed the cross and the Bible back into the box with the gun and the earplugs and the spray bottle. The spray bottle went in last, and as I secured the lid, Mr. Castleberry sat up and stretched grandly. He blinked and looked at me, smiling as he realized I was still there. I had a feeling you would be less easy to scare off. As promised, you'll pass with an A now. Here, he said, and to my surprise, he fished $200 bills out of his nightstand. What's this for? I give anyone who works the sundown shift 200 bucks when they're done. There's more where that came from, if you'd like to come back. The number of people who come back, believe it or not, is surprisingly low. 
I asked him how he could afford this, and he smiled, laughing warmly. I don't teach for the money. I teach because it's what I love to do. My father set me up before I was born, something I don't think Raish knows. Money doesn't mean the same thing to demons that it does to us, and I think he just sees it as a thing I have. I don't covet it, so he doesn't see it as a vice. Two hundred bucks, I thought, for twelve hours of basically nothing. I could sit three nights with Mr. Castleberry and make what I make at the fast food place in a week. I'd have to think about this pretty hard, but I was definitely tempted to come back. I knew what I was in for now, so it would be easier a second time. I knew Raish would probably have more tricks, but maybe I'd be ready now that I was prepared. Before I left that day, I asked him what the demon had given him to get such control after dark. Mr. Castleberry thought about it for a moment and finally decided to share the secret with me. My mother was sick, very sick, and I was looking for a miracle to make her better. Rachael came to me and offered me a deal. He would possess my body after dark, control me from sun up to sun down, and in exchange, my mother would be spared from the disease that was killing her. I agreed on the condition that he couldn't do anything that would take away my ability to be free during the day. He agreed, but it was all for nothing. What do you mean? I asked. Your mother lived, right? For a while. He didn't lie. He cured her of the cancer that was eating away at her. The cancer, however, had damaged her kidneys. She lived another eight months before she died of renal failure. Let that be a lesson to you, should you decide to come back. Demons always promise the moon, but they don't tell you that the cheese is rotten. I left that room $200 richer, and maybe a little wiser, too. Wiser or not, it wasn't the last time I sat with Mr. Castleberry or Rachael. This is how I love to spend my mornings, sitting around, telling stories to my friends, those who come back again and again for another great tale with yours truly. I'll admit it, I'm a bit of a comic book buff myself. Comics, games, collectibles, I like them all. And the subject of today's story is no different. But when he gets his hands on something a little out of the norm, we discover the problems around issue 237. I have acquired Kazar the Amazing, issue 237 to be exact, and it scares the crap out of me. I'm a collector of rare comics. Well, not really a collector, I guess. I never keep them for very long, you see. I prefer to sell the comics for big bucks. I buy them from Goodwill and garage sales and estate sales, anywhere I can pick them up cheap, really. I'm in it for the profit, pure and simple. But today, I may have found something that I wasn't quite prepared for. Briarcliff Estates was having an estate sale, and I knew that there would be some interesting pieces there. Mr. Briar had died at the ripe old age of 103 and was said to be a notorious pack rat. His wife and son had died years ago, both under mysterious circumstances, and Briarcliff had gained an air of mystery ever since. It was said that his house was full of things, everything from antiques and collectibles to, well, downright garbage, and I wanted to have a look. The sale was even grander than I had expected. There were halls cluttered with antique furniture, shelves full of old books, antique kitchen appliances, Persian rugs, strange art, odd articles from around the world. All the trash had been cleared away, and all the items for sale had been tagged and were on display. A large crowd had gathered, and I was more than a little interested in some of the books for my shop. The auction seemed like a total waste of time, though, right up until the last lot. The antique furniture went first, then the old cars from the garage, then the rugs and the appliances, and the strange antiquities. Some of them were pretty grisly. Apparently, Mr. Breyer had been a world traveler in his youth. He had collected things from Africa, Russia, Germany, China, all of them with an eye towards the occult. I actually found myself bidding on a wand made of pure ivory, something my Harry Potter fans would have doubtlessly paid a lot of money for. But a stuffy old man in the front row shelled out about a hundred grand for it, 
and I sat down and shut up after that. He had long white hair and an imposing beard that hung down past the waist of his immaculate gray suit. He was a jarring comparison to the toad-faced man with the all-black oiled hair on his head that sat on the far side of the hall. They seemed to know each other, know and hate each other. They had several hard looks for each other as they held their complicated bidding war, and their battles bled over into the books as well. They snapped up most of the books, old moldering things with hard to pronounce names, and my bids were mostly shouted over as the two dueled for the remaining tomes. Most everyone else had gone, seeing that these two meant to have the lot. So, when the last lot came up, and turned out to be a box of comics, I immediately threw out a bid of $25. I hadn't expected to see any comics here, my focus being on the antique books, but this seemed to be the only thing that these two weirdos didn't want. The bid went once, went twice, and then sold as the two glared at each other from across the room. I took my box of dusty old comics and scuttled off before either of them could realize that I had been there. I, I didn't realize what I had until I got home. I took them to my office and set to work, first a shower, then a change of clothes. Old comics can be finicky, and I like to be comfy when I appraise them. Then the gloves came on, a nice set of reusable rubber ones, and I put on a hairnet, too. Can't be too careful with old comics. After I was set, I opened the box and had a look. I was not immediately impressed. Mr. Breyer, it appeared, had a thing for old Hanna-Barbera comics. There were some Yogi Bears, about ten Huckleberry Hounds, some Tom and Jerry's, and a few wacky racer comics that I'd never even heard of. I set those aside. Hanna-Barbera comics never retail very high, unless you have some of the rarer pieces, that is. They were all in bags, though, and looked to be in pretty good shape, so I could at least get asking price for them. Next came some old Johnny Quest comics, and they also went to the side. Then I pulled out some, oh crap, some old detective comics that looked to be from the early 40s run. They were bagged and looked to be in great shape. I sat those on the desk by the computer. Looked like my purchase wouldn't be entirely in vain. There were some other things in there, some well-loved action comics, a few Batman issues from the late 60s, and a single issue of a comic series that I had never heard of. Sitting at the bottom of the box in a plastic sleeve that looked to be caked with dust and, I don't know, maybe soda, I guess, was a copy of Kazar the Amazing, issue 237. I had never heard of Kazar the Amazing, and he appeared to be some sort of magician detective or something. I was also unfamiliar with Keystone Comics, and decided to go do some research. As I brought it over to the computer, though, I felt a strong urge to drop it and just walk away. The comic felt weird, even through the gloves, and the bag was tacky in a way that soda usually wasn't. I don't know how to describe it. It was like the comic didn't want to be held. I shrugged it off at the time, but I, I can feel it now as it sits on the nightstand beside my computer. It, it doesn't it doesn't want me to touch it. I looked up Kazar and found that it was part of a debut series from Keystone Comics. Kazar was in fact the only comic series they had put out, and it had a very limited run. Less than 500 issues of each comic were ever made, and they were extremely rare and not often seen at auction. Issue 237 was actually the last issue ever printed before Keystone Comics burned to the ground in 1975. The fire was supposedly investigated and ruled as an accident, despite four people having perished in the blaze. Chuck Landstar, the owner, and the writer of Kazar, his assistant, Mike Dre, and the illustrators who worked on the comic, Jug and Dale Treblow, had all been killed in the fire. The series had never seen the light of day again. Apparently this issue had less than the usual amount on the run. Even in its ratty condition, it was worth over a thousand dollars. Cha-ching! Twenty-five dollars for a thousand dollars seemed like a great deal to me, and who knew what kind of bidding war I could get on this thing. I gingerly removed it from the bag and threw it away as no customer would want it in that state. The comic itself was ragged, the spine bent, some of the page corners damaged or missing. The pages themselves looked pretty good, old, but good, until I got to a spot near the back. Towards the end, Kazar appears to be casting some sort of spell to summon an ancient deity. He stood in the middle of the circle, laid with etchings and stone runes, and I could see quite a few bodies laying around as well. Some of them seemed intricate and embellished enough to make me think they might be the main characters he'd sacrificed. 
But I knew nothing of the series, so I could only speculate. There was a dark-haired woman in a slinky dress that barely contained her assets. A blonde guy with a loincloth and a skull helmet. A young boy in a red cloak. And another, a less buxom redhead that seemed to have died holding hands with the kid. They were all laid out in a circle, and their deaths seemed to have been unkind. Kazar was kneeling, resplendent in his yellow and green robes, as he made his request before the towering form on the horned helm. Its eyes were coals beneath the visor, and its green armor was stained with ancient blood. It sat atop a bone-white horse, steam curling from its nostrils, as it brandished a sword at Kazar that looked big enough to cut him in half. Kazar was making his request, but the words had been smudged. That the figure on the horse didn't, didn't sit right with me. Even through the page, I could could feel his regard. It was like he was looking at me, judging me, weighing my worth. I closed the comic. No sense getting spooked by some old comic, I told myself with a laugh. I took some pictures next, showing the damage, and put it into a new protective bag. I uploaded the pictures to Comic Squire, the service I used to sell comics, and sat back to wait. I pulled some of the other comics I had piled up towards me and started looking them over so I could post them as well. One of the detective comics was worth about $40, that was cool, another was worth about 30 excellent, and I heard a ding from my computer and looked up to see that Kazar had an opening bid of $500. I typed a message to the buyer, someone named Nilrim, informing him that I was firm on 800 and went back to the other comics. Two of the detectives were so much hamster cage liner, but I saved them aside so I could put them with the bulk lot. Two more were worth about 30, and I just started looking up the seventh when my computer dinged again. I looked up to see that the same buyer was offering $800, the price I listed it for, and I nodded and turned back to my work. The bid would sit on the site for an hour, allowing others to bid if they wanted, but I figured this guy would get it, and I would be $800 the richer. I'd barely gotten the seventh comic out of the bag when my computer dinged again. A new bid had come in for $1,000. I checked the buyer, and this time it was a new guy named Morgul. He was offering an extra $50 for overnight shipping. That made me raise an eyebrow, but I suppose he wanted to make sure it arrived undamaged. After all, this was a rare comic, and I sent him a message accepting his offer should he win. I had barely sent the message when Nilrim got back to me with $1,200. This went on for a few hours, and as the bids went up, the bidders began to message me. That was when things got bizarre. From Morgul. Dearest seller, the user Nilrim is trying to purchase your wares under false pretense. He is my rival and merely wants to own the comic so that I cannot. I implore you to award the sale to me and ship with all haste. His wording was strange, but it was nothing compared to what his rival was about to send me. From Nilrim. I must ask that you not sell this piece to Morgul. He wants it not for scholarly endowments, but for his power, and it will bring him much. I must have this item so that it can be sealed away from those who might use it for ill. Thank you. I furrowed my brow at this one. Sealed away from those that might use it for ill. It was a damn comic book. I had barely finished reading the message when I saw that Morgul had sent me another message. From Morgul. I see that you have not offered me my preference in this matter. Has Nilrim offered you something more in return for this item? I assure you I will match whatever offer he makes, no matter the cost. That took me by surprise. These guys were clearly serious collectors, or weirdos, and they could likely pay big money for it. I didn't have to do anything. All I had to do was stay quiet and let these two drive the price up on their own. Simple economics. They wanted it, I had it. Suddenly this ratty comic was looking like a cash cow to me. Even then, I hadn't realized the real value of the piece. I heard the computer ding as a new message from Nilrim came up. Please, I implore you not to be swayed by Morgul's boasting. If he gets the tome, it will be devastating for our world. I implore you to sell it to me. Money is no object. Name your price and I will pay it. I sucked in air through my teeth, my small pile of potential profits forgotten. This fellow had basically written me a blank check. How much would be too much. He had said that money was no object, but there was always a limit. I looked back at the sale and realized that Nilrim had just placed a bid for $50,000.
Morgul quickly countered with 60, and the two went right on sparring as I watched. I pulled up Nilrim's message again, and that was when I realized that his profile had a picture attached. I clicked on it and realized that this was the same guy from the auction today. This picture was of a grandfatherly looking man, long white hair and beard that was downright Gandalf-esque. He was in profile in the picture, just his head and shoulders, but I was willing to bet it was the same guy. This Morgul character was likely the other man, the one who had looked like a toad and been afflicted with all that greasy black hair. They were just continuing their antics from the auction, and I was surprised they had any money left after all the crap they had bought earlier. Another message from Nilrim came in, and this one had a link at the bottom to a new site. This must end. Morgul must not be allowed to own this spell. See what it has wrought last time it was unleashed upon the world. The link brought up an article about Briarcliff Estate. Four bodies had been found on the grounds nearly twenty years ago. They had been arrayed in the garden, the photos looking very similar to the one in Khazar, minus the bodies, of course. Those had been replaced with tape outlines, but their placement was undeniable. Briar's wife, teenage daughter, nephew, and the brother that had been killed in what seemed like a cult activity. Briar had immediately been the first one to be suspected, but some combination of money and alibis given out of fear had cleared him. Still, his reputation in the community had been well earned. Had Briar made a deal with that horned demon? Had Briar possibly discovered something that had led him to fill his hallways with junk in an attempt to insulate himself from whatever might come for him? I saw I had a message from Morgul, a message with his final offer. The link in his message was of a Google Maps location. It was... it was my address. His last message was much less formal and much less pleasant than the others had been. I'm coming for what's mine. See you soon. I've been, been sitting in my office writing all this down for the past hour. I've locked the doors and called the police, but they don't seem to be taking this very seriously. The numbers on the bid haven't gone up in an hour, and even though Nilrim had won, I'm afraid he's never going to get what he paid for. I can see someone moving in the yard outside the window, but when I try to call the police, it just rings and rings. I... I don't know what to do. I can almost feel this comic watching me, even as whatever's outside keeps moving around out there. The sun will be going down soon. I wonder if they'll find my body here, or by some circle in a garden somewhere. Hmm. Sounds like the rain might be beginning to taper off a little. But I think we've still got a little more rain left, and a few more great stories still to come. Parents are a mixed bag. Many of them are just doing their best, though some of them don't know what their best is. It's hard to understand our parents sometimes, especially when you encounter someone with a chip on their shoulder, or maybe with a hole in their head. I'm not sure which was weirder. The fact that Dad had a hole in his head, or the fact that he was just so unimpressed with it. Dad had come home from his job at the steel mill, just as he had a thousand times. We heard him sit his hard hat down by the door as he stripped out of his jumpsuit before coming to dinner. Mom had meatloaf on the table with potatoes and peas, Dad's favorite, and we waited patiently for him to arrive like we always did. If this sounds weird to you, that's because it should. Dad had a strange idea that he should go to work, Mom should stay at home and keep the kids, and that everyone should look like an episode of Leave it to Beaver when he got home. I remember for a while, Mom met him at the door with a cold glass of beer when he came home. He eventually told her to stop so that the dust from the mill didn't get on her. It was odd, but Dad paid the bills, and that's how we liked it. So that's what we did. Mom had gotten half of her welcome home greeting out before it curdled in her throat. My brother had already seen it, but I was still looking at the TV around the corner and hadn't seen it yet. MTV was playing a song by a band I liked, and I looked up at Mom to ask if I could use the bathroom when I noticed Dad's head. Dad, meanwhile, had sat down at the table like nothing was amiss, opening his napkin and putting it on his lap. He was hungry from a day at work, and he had just started asking us about our own day when he noticed our horrified looks. What? What's the matter? All three of us were speechless for a moment. How did he not realize what had us all so gobsmacked? Surely he had to feel that. He had to realize what had happened to him. There was no way 
that a person could be so oblivious of something like that. In the center of Dad's forehead was a hole big enough to stick your pinky finger into. It wasn't like a wound. Wounds usually bleed or appear red or scabby. This one was simply a black hole in his forehead. The edges looked a little ragged, but that more reminded me of a hole that someone had drilled into the pavement than a wound. As strange as the hole was, the fact that it didn't seem to have an exit point was even stranger. Honey, Mom asked, trying to be diplomatic about the situation, did, did something happen at work today? No, Dad said, looking at her speculatively. Well, Stubbins was changing the no-slip grading on the walkways, but that's really not that weird, I guess. Are, are you sure nothing odd happened today, she asked, trying to tiptoe around the matter so she didn't upset him. Sometimes Dad could have a temper, and none of us wanted to see it. I guess, maybe, he seemed to think about it. There was this guy I bumped into on the sidewalk. I fell down, and he helped me up, but, but it was nothing. When she continued to look at him skeptically, he set his fork down angrily and glowered at her. Look, Martha, if you have something to ask, then just go ahead and ask it. I'm trying to eat here. Dad, there's a huge hole in your freaking head. I was never what you'd call subtle. Dad wrinkled his eyebrows at me. What in the hell are you talking about? There's a hole in your forehead. How do you not feel that? Are you trying to be funny? Because you know I don't like jokes. Despite his gruff tone, though, he began feeling around his forehead, as if trying to find the source of discomfort. He seemed half-hearted, like he was just doing it as a favor by looking at it in the first place. But when his fingers touched the ragged edges of the hole, he shuddered a little. I didn't think it had hurt him, not really. It was more like the shudder you get when you have an itch and you scratch it. He inspected it with his fingers for a moment before getting up to look at it in the bathroom mirror. The three of us hovered just outside the door as he looked at it in the mirror, and we must have looked like some old comedy routine as we waited for his prognosis. After a few minutes of poking and prodding at it, he finally turned away and walked past us, leaving us just standing there. We found him at the kitchen table, eating his dinner like any other night. Sit down, your mother's meatloaf is getting cold, he told us, once he noticed we were there. Dad, I started, but Mom put a hand on my shoulder. Harold, there's a hole in your head. Don't you think we should go to the hospital? Dad turned his emotionless gaze on her, making it clear that he didn't want to talk about it. When we didn't move, he growled in his throat in a deep, flimmy way. Doctor won't be able to do anything but poke at it and charge me an arm and a leg. Not going to no doctor. Now sit down and eat. Then he went back to eating, ignoring us until we returned to the table and ate as well. We all tried not to notice the hole as we ate, but it was, it was hard to ignore. As we sat and watched TV that night, the TV screen seemed to reflect off that dark hole. Mom laughed every time the audience did, but Dad never did. Well, that's not entirely true. Dad did this thing when he found something funny. One part chuckle and nine parts flimmy rumble. When I was a kid, I had asked Mom once why Dad never laughed or smiled, and she told me that he laughed often and smiled daily. It's just hard to tell with your father. He's not quite as obvious about it as the rest of us are. After that, I started paying more attention to Dad, and I'd come to the point where I could pick up on the subtle twitches at the corner of his mouth, the gravelly rumble when he chuckled, the minute crinkling at the edges of his beetle-black eyes. They helped me tell when my dad was in a good mood, and when he felt less like hitting and more like patting, when you could ask him for a favor, when it was best to leave him alone. It was a talent my younger brother never learned, and it was a mistake that often earned him a cuff upside the back of the head when he'd try to hit Dad up for money. Dad was enjoying the byplay tonight as Raymond bemoaned everything from his mother to his job, but my mind was still firmly fastened on the hole. As I watched it, I almost fancied that I could see it expand and retract as though it were breathing. I told myself it was the light from the TV, but the longer I watched, the surer I became that it was moving. It was like a ragged mouth, pulling in and pushing out air. It was subtle, like my father's moods, and the longer I watched, the more apparent it became. When my father turned his gaze on me, I realized he had caught me staring. Either go to bed or stop staring at me. You're creeping me out. I pushed off the love seat and went to my room. I knew I wouldn't be able to focus on anything as long as that hole was on display. The next few days were uneventful, I guess, but I noticed that Dad started wearing a hat when he went outside. I wished he would wear it inside, too, because the hole seemed to always be watching me whenever I was around him. 
It wasn't, of course, because it didn't have any eyes, but I could feel that itchy feeling you sometimes get when someone's staring at you. It looked like it was getting bigger, too. But if it pained Dad, he didn't say anything about it. He mostly ignored it, his only exception to ignoring it being the hat he wore outside. Dad was stubborn, but he wasn't foolish. Dad was a sensible person who liked to keep attention off himself. Over the next ten days, the hole got noticeably bigger. When we'd first seen it, it had been maybe big enough to put your pinky finger inside. Now I could have easily put several in there, and still he refused to go to the hospital. Mom tried to coax him, but he said it wasn't worth bothering a doctor over. If it was bad, it would hurt, and it doesn't. If it means to go away, it'll do it on its own. He went to work, came home, watched TV, and all the time that hole continued to grow. I found myself looking at my father more and more often, that gaping chasm seeming to look at me, even when his hat was on. I started having dreams about that hole, and in my dreams it oozed and bled, and a single eyeball rolled around to look at me. No matter what Dad was doing in the dream, that eye stared at me until I came awake, gasping. Then one day, he came to breakfast, and the hole had taken in his eyebrows. It wasn't a hole now, it was more like a pit, a crater, that just so happened to sit in the middle of my father's head. Mom was left with an egg halfway to her mouth as she stared into that gaping void. We could all see it breathing now, the push and pull of its respiration as it drew in its terrible breath. Dad sat eating his own eggs and grits, pretending like nothing was wrong, but it was clear that he felt it too. He refused to answer any of us when we called his name, and left for work with his breakfast only half eaten. I noticed that when he came home from work that day, there was a different hard hat on the table in the entryway. The hard hat had a slant to it, and would better cover the hole. Dad may act like nothing was wrong, but I couldn't. I started avoiding him. I would come down to breakfast late, since I knew he'd be at work. I would make excuses to stay out so I could miss dinner. I did any number of other things to avoid being in the house, but it hardly seemed to matter. I had begun to hear some kind of strange whispering as I lay in bed at night, and it permeated my dreams as the eye inside began to whisper words I didn't understand. The words were alien, harsh and unwantable, but I felt I knew their meaning. My sleep became as ragged as my father's moods, and if I hadn't been barely into my senior year of high school, I think I would have moved out. Then about a month and a half after the spot appeared, Dad didn't come down for breakfast. Mom told us that Dad wasn't feeling well. She said he must have gotten sick in the night, but the way her eyes looked told me something beyond sickness was at play. He didn't go to work that day, and unknown to us, he would never go back to work again. Mom moved into the guest bedroom, and I wouldn't find out till later it was because Dad had locked the door and wouldn't let her in. We could hear him in there bumping around. Mom would leave food in the hallway, but we never saw him take it. This went on until one morning when I forgot my notebook upstairs. I'd been heading to school, leaping through my bag, when I realized I'd forgotten my biology notebook. I had a test that day, and I wanted to study before class. I was halfway up the stairs when I heard the door to my parents' bedroom open. I stopped halfway up, not sure whether I should continue or not. None of us had seen Dad since he went into hiding, and my brother and I had been very curious about what was happening with the hole. I put my fingers on the carpet and scrambled slowly up the stairs, peeking over the edge of the stairs as I heard the scrape of silverware being bumped. I could see my father's back, clad in a bathrobe and knee socks, as he bent over for the day's breakfast tray that my mom had left for him. He seemed to be having trouble grabbing it, and his hands threatened to knock over the juice that she had set beside the bowl of oatmeal. Then he stood up, and I had to put my hand over my mouth as he came into view. The top of his head looked like nothing so much as one of those cartoon holes they used to trap each other. It was a swirling black vortex that looked a mile deep, and as he turned to go back into the room, I could see the hole was like some kind of optical illusion. It was exactly as deep on the other side as it was on the back. He turned and took the tray back into the bedroom, but when he bumped the tray on the corner of the door, I realized why we had heard him banging around so much the last few days. In my dream, the hole always had an eye, but in reality, it had stolen my father's sight. The dreams became different after that. Every night I dreamed that my family was eating around the breakfast table. My brother sat on my left, my mom sat on my right, dad sat across from me, bent over his breakfast as usual. They all sat eating food from a massive pile, their breakfast more like a buffet. I seemed to be the only one paying attention to the strange creature wearing father's clothes, 
and the food he ate was pushed into the circle hole atop his head. As I watched, the eye emerged again, but it wasn't alone this time. The eye was in a face, and the face was long and terrible. The skin was tan and leathery, like a hide left out in the sun too long. The hair was white and fine like a corpse's. The teeth were jagged and yellow, its eyes the cataract threads of the chronically blind, and when its face rolled around to look at me, I would shake as its lips rose in an almost comical grin. As everyone ate, the mouth opened and a low whisper began to assault my ears. Every night, that whisper became a little louder, and over time, I came to understand the words, Shally, shally, may ray, fori, fori, may gra, lee, rally, gray, ga, su, rally, dre, ma. The words slid into my ears like slugs, coating my brain in the forbidden knowledge they possessed. I wasn't sure what the dream meant, but I knew that they were meant for me. Was this, was this the thing that had been staring at me the whole time? Was this the reason I had felt watched? As the dreams continued, I began humming or reciting the words that spoke to myself during the day. I would catch myself making little rhymes out of it, and they were never far from my mind. It was almost soothing to speak those words, a balm to the terrible dreams and the terrible fear that wormed its way through my mind. I knew what it wanted me to do, and one night, I did my part. I needed to use the bathroom in the middle of the night, my bladder full to bursting. I was leaving the bathroom when I noticed that the door to my parents' room was open for the first time in a long time. There was a noise coming from inside, and it sounded pained. I thought maybe one of the dogs had gotten in there and gotten hurt, but I think even then, I knew what I would find. Dad was on the ground, his swirling head practically hyperventilating as it pulled in and out. The swirls had taken in Dad's shoulders and the top of his chest. He was lying on the floor flopping around as his arms protruded from the vortex. I reached down and helped him sit with his back to the bed. He couldn't talk, probably couldn't even see, but he seemed to understand that I was there to help him. As I looked at the swirling mass, though, I felt the words come to my lips. I don't know if they were intentional, but I know they were the words that needed to be said. Shali shali rema, fori fori megra, li rali grega, Su Rally Drema. As the words fell from me, I saw something swirling in the mass of shadows. I was worried it would be the huge eye like the one I'd seen in my dreams, but I was even more afraid that it would be the ancient face that I often saw amidst the vortex. As it swirled and thrummed, I could see the white hair beginning to sprout from the depths. The head was coming on fast, and as those eyes emerged from the depths, I could see the corners cast up in a smile. My shaky legs took me away from him with small, stuttery steps. His face came free of the murk, but it wasn't done yet. As his head slid free, a withered form emerged beneath it. He was naked, looking like some kind of wizened mummy as his leathery skin slid from the dark pool. Below the dark pit that had made up my father's head, his body began to shrivel up like a Fourth of July firework, becoming blackened embers before my eyes. The more of that evil thing that came free, the less of him there was, and when his withered feet touched down on the soft carpet of my parents' bedroom, what remained of my father simply blew away. The old man reached down for the grubby bathrobe that Dad had been wearing, and tittered as he pulled it around himself. Took you long enough, but I guess I can't be upset. You and your father have served me well though you never realized you were doing it. Your reward is not sharing in his fate. Your punishment is knowing you are responsible for my return to this world. What you do with these gifts is up to you. Then he left, just walked out of our house and into the night. As the sun comes up over my mother's kitchen, I realize I've been writing this since I managed to get back to my feet and walk shakily down the stairs. I've been trying to write down as much of this experience as possible, so I won't forget any of it. But it's... it's so weird, and it's hard to put it all into words. What the hell was that thing that ultimately killed my father? Did it... did it make the hole in his head? 
Why him? As I sit here watching the sun come up, I realize I may never know. I think there's just time for one more story before we say goodbye today. And I've saved the best for last, you can be sure. We all have a favorite pet, and some of those pets have some strange tendencies. Maybe they meow to get out when you don't want them to get out. Maybe they scratch up your furniture. But this cat definitely gets the short end of the stick when we hear about Susan and her looking glass cat. Susan smiled as she watched Gus paw at his reflection in the mirror. Did you find another cat to play with, she asked, and Gus looked back with a meow before pawing at his reflection again. She was glad that Gus had found someone to play with, even if it was just his reflection. Gus had been depressed lately. They say that having only one cat could lead to this sort of thing. Cats are social animals, after all. Gus couldn't really play with any of the strays outside Susan's apartment, because she was on the third floor, and a little out of reach for even the most nimble of the wandering felines. That didn't stop Gus from standing on her balcony, though, meowing at the cats below and trying to get their attention. Susan thought it was kind of sad, watching him paw at the screen as he called down to the cats who lived their lives in blissful freedom. But the apartment contract had been very clear on their one-pet-per-unit policy, and Susan didn't want to move just so Gus could have a playmate. Gus was a big orange tomcat that Susan had found wandering near her parents' house before she moved out. He'd been a scrawny little kitten when she'd found him, and she had fallen in love with him almost instantly. Susan had just gone through a bad breakup when she had stumbled across the sad little kitten near the garbage cans one morning. The little fuzzball had helped her get through her loneliness, and she liked to think that she had helped him as well. When she moved out of her parents' house at the end of the year, Susan had taken the little cat with her. She and Gus had been roommates ever since. Gus was a great companion, and didn't seem prone to the midnight zoomies or the sometimes destructive behavior her friends complained about in their cat. Gus liked a scratching post, snuggling in bed with Susan until it was time for her to get up and eating his own food instead of hers. His only real issue seemed to be his loneliness, and Susan could hardly hold that against him. Watching him play with his reflection in the mirror was as cute as it was sad, like a kid playing with his imaginary friend because he couldn't seem to make any real ones. Susan watched him as she got ready for work, and she pulled out her phone as she took some video for Instagram. The scrawny little kitten had grown into a regal orange ball of fur, and to watch him paw at the surface of the mirror was insanely cute. He would cock his head and meow at his reflection sometimes, looking confused at the cat in the mirror, before going back to pawing at the glass. Susan smiled, but there was something just a little off-putting about that confused head turn now and then. She left him staring at himself in the mirror, his game forgotten, as he seemed to be talking to the orange cat in the mirror. Susan came home to find him still sitting in front of the mirror. She asked him if he'd been there all day, and Gus just looked back and meowed before looking back at the mirror again. He was staring at himself, his ears moving back and forth, seeming to Susan like he was having a conversation with his reflection. Growing up with cats, she had seen them sit next to each other and do just that same thing, and Gus's eye contact was more than a little interesting as he watched himself in the mirror. She tried to ignore him as she slid into her PJs, but it was hard the longer it went on. Come on, Gus, want to watch a movie with me? She said, patting the bed as she fiddled with the TV. Gus looked up, meowing happily, but then turned back to the mirror and did an oddly unsure little headcock as he took a few steps towards the bed. In the end, Susan had to come get him and take him over to the bed as the poor old Tom watched the mirror. Susan saw nothing out of the ordinary, the mirror cat just scooped up by her own mirror reflection, but this behavior was wandering into the realm of creepy rather than cute. Gus sat with her happily as Susan watched Friends for the thousandth time, but she caught him glancing back at the mirror more than once as she stroked his silky fur. He wasn't the only one. Susan couldn't help but glancing at it as well, looking at the mirror as if she expected to see something out of the ordinary. She didn't, but it was definitely starting to creep her out. Susan let her keys fall into the bowl by the door, calling for Gus as she slid her shoes off. It had been such a long day. A creepy old man had hit on her at work. The customers were rude, and Susan sometimes wondered why she didn't just quit. She could do better than an assistant manager at a grocery store, and she knew it. If it hadn't been for Gus in this apartment, she'd have likely walked away a while ago. Speaking of Gus, where the heck was he? He almost always came to greet her at the door. She called him again, but there was no response. 
She went to the bedroom and huffed out in mock outrage when she saw him sitting in front of the mirror again. Okay, Furface, this is getting to be a little much. It was cute at first, but now it's super creepy. He meowed pitifully when she picked him up, pawing gently as he tried to get away, but she took him over to the bed and sat down with him. He watched her dutifully as she got changed, his fluffy head turning back to the mirror from time to time as Susan slid into her pajamas, and she couldn't help but glancing at it as well. She wasn't sure, but felt like she could see something moving there when she wasn't giving it her full attention. The mirror was the large rolling kind that the apartments often came with, the one on the closet doors. You could see the whole room in it, and it slid to the side on tracks if you needed something out of the closet. It was a nice amenity to have when you were getting ready in the morning, but it was starting to creep Susan out the longer she looked at it. She got that spidery feeling as she put her back to it like something was watching her. When she pulled her hair into a ponytail and turned to put it up, she almost dropped her scrunchie. Gus was staring at her, head cocked, as he watched her from the front of the mirror. She stepped back, startled, and when her legs bumped against the chair in front of the vanity, she sat down hard. Something came off the bed then, and she heard Gus meowing as he looked at her as if to ask if she was okay. Susan looked back at the mirror and saw that it was empty again, save for her own surprised face and the furry reflection of Gus as he stood by her leg. That night was the first time she covered the mirror. She took some thumbtacks and an old throw blanket and used them to cover the surface. It was silly. She knew it was silly. But she felt better when the mirror's surface wasn't looking at her anymore. Gus walked over to inspect her work, and Susan picked him up as he began to paw at the blanket. Gus would just have to get over it, she thought, and she took him to bed and put something on to distract her and her fears. As she scratched his ears, she felt better, and as the night went on, she almost forgot all about her silly fears from earlier. When she woke up, though, she saw that the blanket had been pulled down, and Gus was again talking to himself. This became a daily routine for her. The first thing she did when she got up or got home from work was to cover the mirror and tell Gus to stop pulling the blanket down. Gus would meow when she did this, looking at the blanket and pawing at the covered surface of the mirror, but Susan was unmoving in her decision to keep the blanket up. She would usually pick Gus up as he pawed pathetically at the blanket and take him off to pet him, but it never stopped him from coming back to it. It never stopped him from uncovering it again, and Susan just accepted that this was Gus's new obsession. The cuts on her big furball were a little harder to ignore, though. Sometimes, while stroking his silky fur, Susan would encounter a scratch or a bite and wonder how exactly he had gotten it. They weren't the sort of wounds a cat could get from just scratching themselves. At least she didn't think they were. When she noticed a bite on the tip of his ear one afternoon, she actually searched the house to see if another cat might have gotten in somehow. His food bowl never emptied any quicker than usual, and there was never any extra scat in the box. If there was some secret cat living in the house, it was extremely quiet when she was there. The only strange thing was Gus's melancholy seemed to have disappeared. His mood had improved, and he spent less time meowing to the cats below the balcony. The only change was that she had to shoo him away from the mirror constantly. If he wasn't in her lap being petted, Gus was at the mirror or at the blanket that covered it. He never took it down while she was there, but he would put his face underneath it or just stare at it like he could hear someone talking. Susan found this extremely off-putting, but what could she do? The mirror was attached to the closet door, and without it, Gus would be free to leave his long orange fur all over her clothes that she had hanging in there. Also, as much as it creeped her out, she couldn't stand to think of Gus being sad again while she was at work. Then, one day, something changed. She came home to find the blanket down and Gus looking at himself as he always did. Seriously, Gus? This is getting annoying. I hate having to put this blanket back up every... But she stopped when Gus turned his amber eyes to stare at her. The two held their gaze for a few moments, but Susan couldn't help but hear the voice of her subconscious as it screamed that this wasn't her cat. It looked like Gus. It sat like Gus. And was a perfectly adorable little ball of orange fluff, but his eyes were different. They were the same amber gold they had always been, but today they were filled with hate. No, not hate, Susan supposed. It was something else, like a king looking at a mud-covered surf. Not with pity, and certainly not with any desire to help it. Gus looked at her with scorn and something akin to disgust. How exactly a cat could portray these things with its fuzzy little face, Susan didn't know, but that's what it was. Gus loathed her. 
She suddenly caught him by the scruff, and when he hissed at her, Susan realized it was the first time she'd heard him do that. He swiped a fat ginger paw at her, and Susan almost dropped him as his claws sliced her wrist. Gus growled and cried in his angry little voice, a voice that was suddenly less cute than usual, and Susan tossed him into the hall and closed the door. Gus bumped at it, hissing and yowling, and Susan was surprised when she realized that her back was against the door. It was like she thought he might just come through the door. She locked it just in case and walked into her bathroom as she washed the cut with soap and water. It wasn't very deep, but the three long scratches had been right across her wrist. She had just finished putting some Bactine on it and looking for a Band-Aid when she heard Gus's pitiful meow from the other room. That sounded more like the lovable fluff Susan knew, so she slapped the Band-Aid on and went to open the bedroom door. Perhaps she had just startled him as he had startled her. She hadn't grabbed him by the scruff of the neck since he was a kitten, and he was quite a bit heavier now. Susan suddenly wondered if maybe she had hurt him, and she opened the door as she prepared to pull him into a hug. Sorry, Gus, you just scared me. I wasn't... But she opened the door and noticed that he wasn't there. She checked the hallway, but Gus was nowhere to be found. Susan shrugged, tallying it up to strange cat behavior, and finished doctoring her arm before going to start dinner. As she cooked, she kept expecting to see Gus come out and sniff or rub up against her leg. Gus was always so curious, and he always came to have a look when she was cooking or watching TV. He had even jumped into the shower with her a few times, though he always instantly regretted it. She began to feel guilty about what had happened earlier, and just wanted to find him so she could pet him and say she was sorry. Even so, those weird eyes kept coming back to her. She couldn't shake the idea that that cat hadn't been her Gus. She didn't see him again until she was cleaning up and getting ready to take the garbage out. Susan was in a bit of a hurry as she tied the bag up and started pulling it out of the can. The plastic pan the chicken had come in had likely leaked into the bottom of the bag, and she wanted to get it to the dumpster before it dripped onto the floor. She hadn't seen Gus since she'd put him out, not even as she ate chicken Alfredo on the couch. He was likely still sulking somewhere, but she figured he'd come out when it was time for bed, and all would be forgiven by tomorrow. She thought she might have heard him, though, and... He sounded upset wherever he was. Susan had cocked an ear several times as she cooked, listening to the meows of a familiar cat from the back of the house. She had called him, even taken the tuna he liked to coax him out, but he had never poked his head out or shown any interest in any of it. Susan had looked all over for him a few times, but as the sound of her sauce bubbling began to sound more like burning, she always returned to the stove. She walked to the door with her swinging bag of trash, and when the door came open with a loud creak, she heard claws scrabbling on linoleum. Susan saw an orange lightning bolt come barreling out from behind the china cabinet and make a break for the open door. She moved purely by chance, and Gus hit the trash bag as he yowled and smacked against the cans and packages inside. Susan dropped the bag, no longer mindful of the chicken drippings, and reached for Gus before he could escape. He had never tried to run away before, not even as a half-starved little kitten, and when her hands settled around him, he yowled and slashed at her furiously. He clawed at her hands, swiped at her face, and Susan stepped back when one paw scored her across the cheek and thought about the garbage a little too late. Whether it was the chicken leavings or some other liquid, Susan felt her feet shoot out from under her as she fell against the china cabinet. Her head smacked against the bulky old thing, and everything went fuzzy as she watched Gus run off into the night. She called his name distantly before passing out and waking up somewhere very different. Susan woke up in the hospital. Her mom was reading a magazine, but as Susan groaned, she called for the nurse and leaned in to have a look at her. The nurse came on the run, and Susan was soon poked and prodded and examined by her mother and several people in scrubs. She was confused and a little scared, and when she asked what had happened, it took her dad coming in from the cafeteria to shed any light on the situation. The complex had called her parents, since they were her emergency contact to let them know that a neighbor had found her passed out in her doorway. They had called an ambulance, and she had been rushed to the ER with a head wound. She had spent three days unconscious, her concussion pretty substantial, and her parents had been worried sick. She asked her dad if he'd been to the apartment, and if he'd seen Gus, but he said he hadn't done much more than put some food in a bowl and lock the place up. He's probably okay, sweetie. Cats are pretty self-reliant. I'll go back tonight and make sure he has food and water, though. They wanted to keep her at the hospital until they were sure that she was okay, but Susan was adamant that she needed to leave. Gus had gotten out, and she needed to find him. He had been scared by the garbage bag and startled when she grabbed him. 
He hadn't meant to scratch her. He was probably cold and scared and waiting for her to come home. And she started to cry when they told her it would be a few more days before she was released. Her dad didn't help matters much. He checked on Gus, but said that he must have gotten out. His food bowl was still full, and he hadn't come home when her dad had called him. He had looked around, but he hadn't seen any sign of him. I'm sure he's just scared and waiting for you to come back. He'll probably meet you at the door when you come home from the hospital, he assured her, his face showing a lot of worry. She came home three days later, after the hospital had run every test they could think of, and Susan was greeted by nothing but a plain beige door and a note from her neighbor wishing her a speedy recovery. She opened the front door thinking maybe he would be there, but the house was cold and empty. It felt lonely without Gus there to welcome her, and she decided then that she had to go look for him. Maybe he was close by, playing with the cats he had seen from the balcony. She would get some treats and call him, and hopefully he would come back after some coaxing, and they could be a family again. She was halfway down the hallway when she recognized a pitiful meow from her bedroom. She came through the door looking frantically for Gus. Had he gotten stuck in the bedroom? How had he been eating and drinking this whole week? She expected that he would come pelting out when the door opened, but he was nowhere to be found. She started looking for him under the bed and in the closet, but when the same sad meow came from behind her, she turned and found the source. It was Gus. He was just as fluffy as she remembered him, and it broke her heart to see how thin he looked under all that fur. He looked troubled, his eyes darting around as he put a paw up and pleaded for her to help him. He looked sorry, like he would do anything, if she could just help him out of this. And as she approached him, Susan could feel her tears coming down in a torrent. Gus pressed his paw against the mirror. His toes were visible from the other side, and as he pressed and shoved, she could see he was becoming upset. Gus was stuck inside the mirror, his world nothing more than a little room, the one he had loved so much. Susan put a hand up to the mirror, covering his little paw with hers, and only then noticed that she didn't have a reflection. She sat and wondered if she'd have to watch her poor cat Gus waste away, unable to help him, and she laid her forehead against the glass as she cried all the harder. Here comes the sun again, here to rain on our parade, as it were, and to end another segment of our cozy horror. I do hope you'll come back tomorrow for more stories, more fun, and more of your favorite doctor. Until then, this is Dr. Plague wishing you a wonderful day and a spooky evening.